Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. Israel National Radio presents Walter's World, the heart-hitting program that brings the news behind the news, with no-holds-barred interviews that get to the core of the matter, as well as on-site reports of current events. Hosted by the doyen of the airwaves, Israel National Radio's senior broadcaster, Walter Bingham. Hello and welcome to... I am Walter Bingham and begin with an assessment of the new government's first weeks and the direction into which they seem to be taking the country. Then there is the scam of Eviatar, trying to trick the families to leave their ten-year-old homes meekly like sheep under some untrue pretext. This is, of course, nothing new, and you will hear the similar attempt of 2007 in Hebron that took a different turn, and that might, God forbid, happen in Eviatar if the residents resist. The initial spontaneous reactions to the new government have now crystallized into considered assessments by both the supporters and the opposition. It took very few weeks to realize into which direction Prime Minister Bennett is taking the country. It's not the one that supporters expected. But to have a Knesset with delegates from eight different parties and a cabinet that includes views across the political spectrum, including for the first time an Arab party, makes his position a difficult one. Unlike the governments headed by Netanyahu, he does not have a large contingent of his Yamina party to support his policies. He is also constrained by the reciprocal veto with alternate Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Yair Lapid of the Yesatit party, whose declared policy differs widely from Yamina. We still have to see how well Bennett negotiates this tightrope. The rude exchanges that we've seen last week in the Knesset plenum do not indicate a sense of cooperation, but rather insurmountable hostility between some Knesset members that does not signal a bright future for the government. The main stumbling block preventing the smooth conduct of the government's agenda is the presence of the four-seat Arab Ram party in Knesset and its leader Mansour Abbas in cabinet. With a government's majority of just one seat, they're well aware of the power in their hands. There'll be a short break, but don't go away, there's a lot more. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. With a government's majority of just one seat, they're well aware of the power in their hands to make or break any proposed legislation that would otherwise even receive universal support. In the right-wing view, Mansour Abbas is exploiting the situation by trading his votes in return for government commitments that are not only dangerous for the security of the state, but also for the population at large. In other words, they believe that Mansour Abbas is holding the country to ransom. On the other hand, the supporters of the Bennett Lapid government see the Ram Party as justified in their attempt to right the wrong that they believe has been inflicted on the Palestinian people. Are they prepared to concede everything Mansour Abbas expects? A key phrase of the Ram Party head is that we expect that our partners show a positive approach towards the demands of the Arab society. And in its charter, the Ram Party denounces Zionism as a racist ideology. These are some of their demands. 
the right of return for Palestinians, expelled, as they call it, in 1948. In return for their vote to support the new government, they expect the legalization of all Arab construction in the Negev, no settlement expansion in Area C of Judea and Samaria, and the cessation of the expulsion of Arab residents in the Jake Jarrah neighborhood. That's the Shimon Hatzadik area of Jerusalem, regardless of the law. Another of their demands is for Arab family members who live in Palestinian Authority areas, or indeed abroad, to be allowed to join Arab Israeli citizens or residents in Israel. In other words, to discard the family reunification law. The implications of that would be a flood of phony relatives and embedded undesirables. All this is just a starter. A recent statistic discovered that a large percentage of terrorists are offspring of legal Arab immigrants under the family reunification law. Unlike other Islamist movements that seek to destroy Israel by force and terrorism, the Ram Party is using the democratic process to achieve the same aim. That method is far more dangerous because it fakes cooperation but aspires to the same cause, a Palestinian state to replace Israel. By the way, Hitler used democratic means to attain power. Then there is the government's Eviatar scam. Yes, it's the same scam that the convicted criminal, former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert used in Hebron some years ago when the Jewish occupants of some market premises that they converted into homes were tricked to leave their homes, which they built there, by the method used today in Eviatar. They left voluntarily on the promise that the government will establish the original Jewish ownership and then they will be allowed to return. That's what the government said to the Eviatar residents. A blatant lie. Nothing was ever done in Hebron, and the property, which is adjacent to several new blocks of flats in a Jewish district, remained empty for years. Eventually, two families decided to move in and fortify their homes. On the 12th of August 2007, something happened, and here is my report from that day. You might find it difficult to listen to, not because it's an old recording, but because it's very harrowing. Today's marketplace in Hebron was, since at least the year 1540, a part of the Jewish quarter of the city. It was a bustling hive of activity until 1929, when 67 Jewish men, women and children were murdered in Hebron by Arab hordes. Those who survived abandoned their property and fled for their lives. The area was turned into a marketplace. Since then, and until the Jordanians were defeated in the war of 1967, Jews were prevented from even visiting Hebron, the location of the tombs of our patriarchs and matriarchs. But now, there is a sizable Jewish presence there, and the Machpelah, the resting place of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah, is again open to Jews. There are occasional skirmishes with hostile Arabs, but unfortunately the main quarrel is with our own government and its law enforcement agencies, who, far from enforcing the law, are the agents of an administration that operates with lies and deceit. Legal property purchases by Jews are disputed by the Attorney General, making life for the occupants a constant battle against the authorities. The latest example is Beit Shalom, purchased from an Arab for an amount in the region of 700,000 US dollars. It is as if the present Israeli government, headed by a psychopath, is the defender of the very same people whose sole aim is to destroy Israel and drive us from our land. The dictionary definition of psychopath is a person suffering from chronic 
mental disorder with abnormal or violent social behavior. Olmert has demonstrated time and again that he orders violence against his kith and kin, which is undoubtedly chronic abnormal behavior. One of his government's dirty tricks was to entice the Jewish occupants of the market buildings here in Trevron to leave under the pretext that their legality is about to be confirmed and they are then free to return. That was 18 months ago, but no further documents changed hands. The Hebron Jewish community realized that they were duped, and not for the first time. Some time ago, two families moved back into those buildings. Now, Olmert is again demonstrating his abnormal social behavior in violently trying to expel the occupants from the marketplace. The sooner he will be expelled from the premiership, the better it will be for all of Israel. You can hear from the background noise that I am where it's all happening. There are crowds of people here trying to defend these premises and its occupants from being evicted. One doesn't really know when it's all going to happen, but it's expected sometime in the small hours of this morning. That would be Tuesday morning. I'll be here all night to see what is happening. The time is now half an hour after midnight and there are still a very large number of people milling around outside these apartments which are threatened with destruction, expulsion of the owners and I'm in one of these apartments and the family who lives here is with me now and here is the Balhabayits, the man of the house. What's your name, sir? Jose Alon. You see that there are very many people here tonight supporting you in your plight to remain in your home. People are outside and people are visiting and people are giving you encouragement and all the time we are waiting if the evil forces of the expulsionists are coming to do their dirty work here. What are your feelings? I think that what I'm feeling is not so uh, important. What's the important is that Am Israel, after 2,000 years, come back to Eretz Israel and uh, build Eretz Israel. But we're talking about the uh, threatened destruction of your home. Yes, but it's only a small uh, picture from the big picture. Yeah, I understand that you are very modest here, but I must tell you that to live in Hebron is not easy. It's not like living in the big city. You've gone into a place which was derelict. It's part of a market building, and you've made it into a home, and you live here with your family, and now you are threatened by the army who want to throw you out, although they had actually promised that this is going to be open for occupation and that you will be legally allowed to come back here. They fooled you, now you're back in. What are you going to do when they come? I think that it's also not so important what I will do. What is important is that uh, Am Israel come at Chia, come back to Eretz Israel, and we hope that all uh, the people of the Jews will come back and to live in Eretz Israel. All the years we dream to come back to Eretz Israel, and now we still uh, dream and we still uh, come back to Eretz Israel. Thank you very much, Moshe. That's an attitude that I would find difficult to emulate. It's now 25 minutes to 5 in the morning and we've just heard that the soldiers are on their way. The lights in the area have been switched off. Everybody has taken their positions. They are barricading themselves in to the flats and now we're awaiting the arrival of the expulsion forces. It's another very sad moment in the Jewish history and in the history of this country.
barricades at the entrance to the area and the jeeps with soldiers are cruising back and forth and one group of soldiers has come on foot and is standing about 30 yards from the entrances to the apartments. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Shalom, I'm Leah Aharoni. Join me on my show, News from the Torah. Each Sunday, we'll use the weekly Torah portion as a prism for understanding the news today. Listen to News from the Torah to gain clarity about the times we're living in and to understand your own spiritual path in the process. News from the Torah every Sunday on Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. There are heavy barricades at the entrance to the area, and the jeeps with soldiers are cruising back and forth, and one group of soldiers has come on foot and is standing about 30 yards from the entrances to the apartments. One of the entrances is barricaded with a large tire fire. It really is large, but the local fire brigade, Jewish fire brigade, is standing by. The air is permeated with a heavy smell of smoke. The interesting thing here is that these two apartments are surrounded by several blocks of flats in which many Jews are living. So it's really a puzzle why they are so keen on emptying those two apartments. The voice that chants the prayers over the loudspeaker just said in Hebrew that Hebron is a holy city and if you make war on Hebron, it's like making war on Yerushalayim, on Jerusalem. Old and young are here people of all ages, and I've got one of the younger ones sitting with me. What's your name? Yaisa. Uh, you're visiting here. Where are you from? New York. You've just been outside. What did you do outside? With whom did you speak? A soldier. What did you ask him? How could you be doing this to the Jews? And what did he say to you? He said, I don't want to go to jail for 40 days. He showed you something. What did he show you? A necklace. It was a cross of a Christian. He was a Christian soldier? Yeah. He told me that he's Christian. And did you say anything else to him? Yes. Who are you? Where are you from? He said, I'm a Lebanese. And then he said, I'm a Christian. Let me get this right. You asked the soldier, who are you? Why are you here? Yes. And then... He said to you, he's a Lebanese, he is a Christian? He said, I am a Lebanese and I am a Christian. And did you ask him, what are you doing in in the Israeli army? Yes. And did he answer you? Yes. What did he say? He said, I like the army very much. That was a very interesting story. a real spirit of resistance here. We've had prayers, we've had fanfares, we've had rousing music. Everybody is ready when the police with riot shields and helmets goes into action. It seems to me that they were waiting for daylight. I found the police spokesman, he's Major Danny Pollack. Major Give me an explanation 
about this action today. I came through Hebron mm -hmm. and in the Arab quarter. There were so many empty buildings. What's the purpose of trying to vacate just two small apartments? Taking the people out of these buildings is the decision of the High Court. And we're just taking out the decision and doing what we're supposed to do. It's not our decision. It's the High Court's decision. And you're having to bring such a large contingent of troops equipped for riot. What do you expect to get here? We have to um, make sure that we're well fit for any action. Are you personally happy about the situation? I don't have any personal issues with this. I'm an officer of the police force. No personal things involved. Those words remind me of the excuse of the Nazis. I had to obey orders. But were they moral? It seems to me that they were waiting for daylight. And now hundreds of steel-helmeted soldiers are storming into the area. They are armed, they're carrying riot shields, and the expulsion has begun. Doors seem to be well and truly barricaded, and more water is coming down from the top. It's just making it uncomfortable for the soldiers. It will not stop them from breaking in. I stood behind a police colonel, and they were pouring some water down from the top floor, and I got a few splashes. I said to the reporter behind me, oh, water, with which the police colonel turned around and said, look, don't talk behind my back. He obviously had a guilt complex. And when I said to him, look, you're mistaken, I didn't talk behind your back. I spoke about the water I was splashed. And he said, now do your job or I'll arrest you. That's the attitude here. Colonel, you said you want to speak with me if I ask you? Colonel, you said you will speak with me. If I have a spokesman. Speak I, uh, with him. Now they're banging on a different door. This has to be seen to be believed. It's a wooden door and he's with all his might and a big sledgehammer, he's going for the door. And with glee, he seems to love his job. It's unbelievable. They're in, and I'm following in to the apartment in which I spend the night. And the people are sitting in there. They're going upstairs. And the girls here are crying. And I feel the same. Don't push him. You push him? Why? Why are you photographing? This is a, a policeman photographing everything that goes on. I just saw the man who owns his apartment holding his baby. He's as white as a sheet. And now they are dragging the people down. A man is being forced and grabbed by the police. And they're dragging him out. pushed here by these policemen. Who do they think they are? It's outrageous what is happening here. They're asking for reinforcements to drag some girls and people out of here. Are you happy? Yes. Well, is it a nice job to do this? Please. Well, are you Jewish? Yes. A neck hold on a small boy to pull him out. Oh, that was good. And now they're dragging another man out. He's hurting. They put him into a twist grip. And now four more are carrying him out. One little boy. Four or five policemen are carrying him. It is outrageous. I'm quite sure there are one or two. In fact, I spoke to one policeman who is also pale as a sheet. And he's keeping in the background. He's not doing any hard work. He's not grabbing hold of anyone. 
but he has to be here to do his job. The high-ranking police officer told me if they don't do the job, they have to resign. Another man is being dragged out. I've now gone outside into the area and they are dropped off outside the cordon and the policemen who carried him there are rushing back to do more. Gleefully they do it. Hundreds of them. Listeners, if you would see this, you would be outraged. It's not going to last. It's not going to do them any good. Another boy is being dragged out. Of course they're resisting. They don't want to go, but they're dragging them and taking them to the other side of the cordon. There's a man. He is about 65. He's struggling, but four men are carrying him out. They're having great fun doing this. Even as a reporter, you cannot help but being upset about what is going on here. What amazes me, of course, is that they do this in front of the world's media. It will be in all television channels. It will be in every newspaper. And they don't care. One soldier is carrying a child away. He may be about five. Where are his parents? The boy is running, struggling. They're pushing him away. I don't know where he lives. I think even the most left-wing reporter must be disgusted at the action of the police here. What about the belongings of those people whom they threw out from there? Another woman is being dragged out by men. She should be handled by women. This is wrong. It's men now mishandling the women. This lady that's been carried now by three or four policemen must grabbing her leg and carrying her out. She must be in her early 50s. What is this? Why do you not go in there and you have to bring the women? Why don't you bring them? Ladies, you carry the ladies with the religious people. Now there are some police women taking her outside of the cordon. It's another lady being carried by four soldiers. She's now on the floor. And the cameramen are there photographing it. Well, the police must be proud of themselves today. They've had a very successful day. Once outside the cordon, they are, of course, prevented to come back in. I'm now looking at the door of the second apartment, which they haven't yet been able to enter. It's extremely well barricaded. The man with a sledgehammer has arrived, and he's now beginning to swing. He's doing it very, very happily. Stay tuned for the conclusion of this harrowing story after the break. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Local Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. There are heavy barricades at the entrance to the area and the jeeps with soldiers are cruising back and forth and one group of soldiers has come on foot and is standing about 30 yards from the entrances to the apartments. One of the entrances is barricaded with a large tire fire. It 
really is large, but the local fire brigade, Jewish fire brigade, is standing by. The air is permeated with a heavy smell of smoke. The interesting thing here is that these two apartments are surrounded by several blocks of flats in which many Jews are living. So it's really a puzzle why they are so keen on emptying those two apartments. The voice that chants the prayers over the loudspeaker just said in Hebrew that Hebron is the holy city and if you make war on Hebron, it's like making war on Yerushalayim, on Jerusalem. Old and young are here, people of all ages, and I've got one of the younger ones sitting with me. What's your name? Yes. Uh, you're visiting here. Where are you from? New York. You've just been outside. What did you do outside? With whom did you speak? A soldier. What did you ask him? How could you be doing this to the Jews? And what did he say to you? He said, I don't want to go to jail for 40 days. He showed you something. What did he show you? A necklace. It was a cross of a Christian. He was a Christian soldier? Yeah. He told me that he's Christian. And did you say anything else to him? Yes. Who are you? Where are you from? He said, I'm a Lebanese. And then he said, I'm a Christian. Let me get this right. You asked the soldier, who are you? Why are you here? Yes. And then... He said to you, he's a Lebanese, he is a Christian? He said, I am a Lebanese and I am a Christian. And did you ask him, what are you doing in, in the Israeli army? Yes. And did he answer you? Yes. What did he say? He said, I like the army very much. That was a very interesting story. There's a real spirit of resistance here. We've had prayers, we've had fanfares, we've had rousing music. Everybody is ready when the police with riot shields and helmets goes into action. It seems to me that they were waiting for daylight. I found the police spokesman, he's Major Danny Pollack. Major. Give me an explanation about this action today. I came through Hebron mm -hmm. and in the Arab Quarter. There were so many empty buildings. What's the purpose of trying to vacate just two small apartments? Taking the people out of these buildings is the decision of the High Court. And we're just taking out the decision and doing what we're supposed to do. It's not our decision. It's the High Court's decision. And you're having to bring such a large contingent of troops equipped for riot. What do you expect to get here? We have to um, make sure that we're well fit for any action. Are you personally happy about the situation? Like I don't have any personal issues with this. I'm an officer of the police force. No personal things involved. Those words remind me of the excuse of the Nazis. I had to obey orders. But were they moral? It seems to me that they were waiting for daylight. And now hundreds of steel-helmeted soldiers are storming into the area. They are armed, they're carrying riot shields, and the expulsion has begun. The doors seem to be well and truly barricaded, and more water is coming down from the top. It's just making it uncomfortable for the soldiers. It will not stop them from breaking in. I stood behind a police colonel, and they were pouring some water down from the top floor, and I got a few splashes. I said to the reporter behind me, oh, water, with which the police colonel turned around and said, look, don't talk behind my back. He obviously had a guilt complex. And when I said to him, look, you're mistaken, I didn't talk behind your back. I spoke about the water I was splashed. And he said, 
Now do your job or I'll arrest you. That's the attitude here. Colonel, you said you want to speak with me if I ask you? Colonel, you said you will speak with me. If I have a spokesman. Speak I, with uh, him. Now they're banging on a different door. This has to be seen to be believed. It's a wooden door and he's, with all his might and a big sledgehammer, he's going for the door. And with glee, he seems to love his job. It's unbelievable. They're in, and I'm following in to the apartment in which I spend the night. And the people are sitting in there. They're going upstairs. And the girls here are crying. And I feel the same. Don't push him. You push him? Why are you photographing? This is a, a policeman photographing everything that goes on. I just saw the man who owns this apartment holding his baby. He's as white as a sheet. And now they are dragging the people down. A man is being forced and grabbed by the police. And they're dragging him out. with you. Oi! Don't push! I'm being pushed here by these policemen. Who do they think they are? It's outrageous what is happening here. They're asking for reinforcements to drag some girls and people out of here. Are you happy? Yes. Well, is it a nice job to do this? Please. on a small boy to pull him out. Oh, that was good. And now they're dragging another man out. He's hurting. They put him into a twist grip. And now four more are carrying him out. One little boy, four or five policemen are carrying him. It is outrageous. I'm quite sure there are one or two. In fact, I spoke to one policeman who is also pale as a sheet, and he's keeping in the background, he's not doing any hard work, he's not grabbing hold of anyone, but he has to be here to do his job. The high-ranking police officer told me if they don't do the job, they have to resign. Another man is being dragged out. I've now gone outside into the area. And they are dropped off outside the cordon, and the policemen who carried him there are rushing back to do more. Gleefully they do it. Hundreds of them. Listeners, if you would see this, you would be outraged. It's not going to last. It's not going to do them any good. Another boy is being dragged out. Of course they're resisting, they don't want to go, but they're dragging them and taking them to the other side of the cordon. A man, he is about 65, he's struggling, but four men are carrying him out. They're having great fun doing this. Even as a reporter, you cannot help but being upset about what is going on here. What amazes me, of course, is that they do this in front of the world's media. It will be in all television channels. It will be in every newspaper. And they don't care. One soldier is carrying a child away. He may be about five. Where are his parents? The boy is running, struggling. They're pushing him away. I don't know where he lives. I think even the most left-wing reporter must be disgusted at the action of the police here. What about the belongings of those people whom they threw out from there? 
Not a woman is being dragged out by men. She should be handled by women. This is wrong. It's men now mishandling the women. This lady that's been carried now by three or four policemen must grabbing her leg and carrying her out. She must be in her early 50s. What is this? Why do you not go in there and you have to bring the women? Why don't you bring them? Ladies, you carry the ladies uh, with the religious people. Now there are some police women taking her outside of the cordon. It's another lady being carried by four soldiers. She's now on the floor. And the cameramen are there photographing it. Well, the police must be proud of themselves today. They've had a very successful day. Once outside the cordon, they are, of course, prevented to come back in. I'm now looking at the door of the second apartment, which they haven't yet been able to enter. It's extremely well barricaded. The man with a sledgehammer has arrived, and he's now beginning to swing. He's doing it very, very happily. He must be a volunteer to do this work. Now he's kicking at the door and any moment now it's opening. The high-ranking police officer who was threatening to arrest me is also standing there. He seems to be the one directing the immediate operations. Some of the police uniforms have some kind of eagle at the back, a sword, and the word Israel. It's really shameful, isn't it? There are quite a number of Ethiopian soldiers here who are doing the work. And that's uh, very astounding because they were rescued from Ethiopia to live here in freedom and they're doing exactly what the Ethiopian government did to them. Well, the door has given part of the way and they are now forcing their way through the gap and we'll see a repetition of what happened in the other apartments. Well, they're now bringing out the barricades because they still can't get in. One large oil drum, a large iron contraption, and still they have problems in entering. Looking at these men, they ought to be talking German uh, rather than Hebrew. They're now dragging out the people. Oh, there's a truck here. You should see it. The heavy equipment they brought. Generators, drills, circular saws, and a great deal of equipment. Gas cylinders. They really thought they have to go to town for the sake of uh, evacuating or expelling two families from two small flats. And of course, the cost of all this must be forbidding. It's now one hour into the operation and it hasn't finished by a long way. Hey, be careful! like that, silly men. I just pulled up a policeman who was pushing a girl fairly roughly. In this operation, one can learn to recognize Slav faces. There must be lots of Russians among them. There are a great number of police photographers here making a record of everything, including all the people who have resisted and who are being carried out. General, has anybody been arrested? I don't know. No, no, no. Maybe not yes, yet. but I don't know. Not yet. Well, when you say not yet, what do you mean? You're looking forward to that? No comment. Surely you don't want to do that. He's a high-ranking general. He's shy. Besides those policemen who have been taking part in the operation and who are manning the immediate cordon, there are a great number behind who have not been called upon to do anything. They are standing on all the rooftops, in fact very high up on the apartment buildings, 
one might think that President Bush or Condoleezza Rice is present. Dozens of police are chasing girls who are just standing here doing nothing much, trying. Oops! That was not nice. Listen, listen. That was not nice. He threw a girl on the floor. I am watching how they are mishandling people. These are young girls who just want to come into a courtyard and they're not allowing it. Leave them. And now a other police officer came and said should let them go. All they want is to be in the courtyard. And the same in another corner. Look, 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 they can go. Leave them. They can, look, they can go there. Leave them. Now somebody has given them the order to let the women go. There must be about 50 girls here who've been caged in until someone thought they're not doing any harm. Let them go. Dear listeners, I'm glad I'm here and I can see this and I re can report it to you because it has to be seen. All that for two small apartments. It seems that one group of police are taking one action and then someone else comes along and said, no, leave it, it doesn't matter. But now all those girls I spoke about are confined in the courtyard. Another man is on the floor and it must be hurting him. They are really handling the people rough as they push them outside the court. Uh, and the floor is rough concrete, and they drop them onto the floor, which isn't very pleasant. I have in a number of cases intervened when they were rough and was successful in some. And this young man had just come to me earlier and said, thank you for helping me. And now somebody got hold of him and pushed him out. Maybe he didn't like his face. It seems that in the second apartment they still haven't been able to get to the upper floors because I can see people peering out from behind the bars. It's also amazing that there are very many soldiers who are carrying weapons. Whom did they expect to shoot? Now they're preparing the mechanical saws and various other tools for breaking doors. There are still barricades which they are trying to break down. They are now breaking down the iron protection for the windows. The interesting thing is that behind it is uh, concrete, cement. So they are still no further. Imagine they put iron plates in front of the window and when they finally got the iron plates off with heavy tools they are faced with a wall and now the hydraulic power tools are being taken into operation on the concrete breaking that it seems that the operator is having great fun because it would be an achievement for him when he has broken through the furniture vans are now unloading masses of cardboard cartons so it seems that they will soon go into the apartments and empty them. And you can imagine what their possessions will be like when the furniture removers or the soldiers are throwing everything into boxes. They are now almost finished removing the concrete and behind it is yet another barrier. I see one civilian strapped in on a stretcher being brought out by Magen David Adom. Another casualty, this time a young boy, and behind it, another stretcher. This young boy has a stretcher under his chin. He must have been very badly damaged. I've already mentioned that 100, 200 girls are confined in an area of a courtyard and a garden and can't move. And I found one young lady who has been pushed around by police. What's your name? Noah. What happened to you, Noah? 
I was in the room with a couple other girls. That is one of the apartments that where they throw out the people. Yeah. We waited there, and, and the people that broke down the wall were men. They grabbed us and took us down out the door. And then the woman came and pulled us out to here. And they pushed you very hard? Yes, I see you still suffering from shock. I think you should go to Magen Davida Dome and be treated for shock. What do you think of it all? It's terrible. <laughs> I know. I'll let you go now. This young girl was shaking. Every exit from this courtyard and garden of the apartment buildings here is blocked off. I'm now approaching, I'm approaching a line of, oh, a dozen riot police with shields who are standing there preventing anybody from going. They're just letting me through, but no one else. I'm now on my way back to the second apartment to see if they've made any progress with breaking into the upper floors, but I still hear generators going, so they're obviously inside now. I... What is happening in this box? Well, there is a large wooden crate into which people have barricaded themselves, and now they're trying to break in. This is the most fortified place I've ever seen. Just spotted David Wilder, the spokesman for the Jewish community here in Hebron. David, give me your assessment of it all. We had to deal today with a very, very brutal expulsion of families from our homes and from our land. Uh, this is a very, very sad event. However, uh, we will come back. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. We've said that we're going to come back. People were dragged away. People were stamped on. Uh, the building where I am right now, not one person raised a hand against the police. There were people that were dragged out by their necks. Uh, very unfortunately, I saw people, the, 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 the riot squad that came on, stamped on there with their, with their boots. Um, but, but nobody raised a hand and nobody raised a fist, uh, and everybody was dragged away. Um, but, but as I said, we will come back. This is our land. This is our property. This is part of Hebron. Uh, this is part of God-given Eretz Yisrael, the Jewish people, and, uh, and we'll be back. They have still not managed to get at the three men who are in the crate. Of course, they can't go wild at it because they cannot injure them. They're trying very hard, but the operation is now slowly winding down. Found a lady who lives in Beta Dasa, which is a uh, building here in Hebron. So you were there present and you were watching what was going on. What is your view of what you saw and how it all developed? This is only a um, small situation in our uh, long and uh, faithful way. We are going to back. This is our land. Hashem is our king. And we are here. Oh. And you think that these two apartments will again be reoccupied? And with those words, I end my report from the expulsion in Hebron. That would have been the experience of the 53 brave pioneering families of Eviatar had they resisted their expulsion and not fallen for the dirty trick of the government. Whatever their decision, they lost. Let us hope that they can soon return to their homes. God willing, I'll be back again next week, same time, same place, with more from Israel and the rest of the Jewish world. Until then, this is Walter Bingham, wishing you a good week, free from COVID. And please think of your elderly neighbor, who may even be a Holocaust survivor, once again cooped up and unable to go out to do their necessary shopping. So please visit them and ask if you can help, you know, it's your humanitarian duty. Goodbye. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. 
The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips. With scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Torres from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 